Hello, welcome to Cycling Tips, David, and welcome to my garage. I'm stuck inside today because, well, it's grim outside. It's wet, it's windy, it's cold. It's very much like how we all wish Roubaix was going to be like this year. But as I'm guessing you already know, the race isn't on this year. It's been cancelled. That damn COVID is ruining everything, isn't it? But fear not. I'm hoping this video is going to ease that cobble frustration because it's going to be a bit of a, a Paris-Roubaix 101. I'm going to have a delve into the history. We'll have a look at a, a few of the classic editions and we'll also look at some of the tech that's been used to get through the rough stuff. Right, let's crack on. Roubaix 101 first, little bit of history. Now we have got probably about four or five gentlemen to thank for there actually being a Roubaix. The first edition was held in 1896, but it was in 1895 when the idea started getting thrown about. Two gentlemen from Roubaix who were textile merchants, Maurice Perez and Theodore Vienne, came up with the idea that they wanted to start a race in Paris and finish in their hometown of Roubaix. These two guys had built the velodrome in the town and they thought bringing a race to Roubaix would put the town on the map because, to be honest, there's absolutely no reason to go there. It's a bit of a dive. All the big races started or finished in Paris, so these two guys went to the newspaper of Le Velo, which was France's only daily sports newspaper back then. They put the idea to Minard, the editor-in-chief there, who really liked the idea, but he needed to get the director of the newspaper on board, Paul Rousseau. So the three gentlemen wrote a letter to Paul Rousseau laying out their ideas for this big bike race. Basically, the letter said that this race of what would be about 250 kilometres would be just a little leg opener, a warm-up race for the then hugely popular Bordeaux Paris bike race, a race that covered over 500 kilometres in 14 hours usually. Yeah, that's right, it was basically just going to be a bit of a prologue to a big bike race. Rousseau liked the idea, so sent his cycling editor out on the roads to try and find a route. Louis Minard, the cycling editor, took up the challenge, spending a day leaving Amiens, which is still on the race route today, to Roubaix. He arrived in Roubaix, battered, bruised, wet, basically the standard Roubaix feel, and swore that he would send a telegram back saying that this race, this route, was a terrible idea. Luckily, though, he got drinking that night with the two textile merchants and the team from Roubaix who wanted to put the race on. And just like alcohol in any situation, a bad idea became a superb idea. And that telegram never got sent. Thank you, Red Wine. So there we have it, a brief history of how the race got started. The prize money for the first edition in 1896 was a 1,000 francs, which equated to roughly about seven months' wages for a miner. I mean... Not a youthful person, but somebody who worked down the mines. Cobble classic. <laughs> Ready? Okay, let's have a quick rundown of just a few of the classic additions within living memory. Or within my living memory. Kind of. 1981 for starters. Just goes down in history because the winner that year basically said, for in a rough translation, that the race is bullshit. Bernal Hino was never one to mince his words and he definitely didn't like the race, even though the following year he went on to win it again in 1982 after crashing seven times, running over a dog and chasing down the breakaways. I suppose the next really memorable edition would be 1988 when Dirk de Mol, a man who is now DS at Israel Startup Nation, won the race in an exceptionally long breakaway. De Mol didn't line up in Compiègne that day thinking that he would win the race. But an early breakaway, he stayed away. And well, now he's got his name in a shower block, I suppose. The sad thing, well, not so much sad thing about that edition, but the few editions around that year was that they weren't finished on the Roubaix Velodrome. Instead, they finished outside the factory of the sponsor of the race. Whose idea was that? Let's jump forward to the 1990s and 1996 has to be the standout year because Mappe, the super team of the era, managed to get a 1-2-3. What can you say about that apart from, well, 
uh, Mappy. The next edition that I think nobody will argue about being an epic race was 2001 when Snerven Knaven, I'm terrible at saying names, won the race. That was pretty much the last edition which was held in vile, vile weather or awesome, awesome weather, depending on what way you look at it. The photos are amazing. It definitely goes down as a classic, classic. The following year in 2002 gave us Tom Boone and a very youthful Tom Boone, I should say, in third place. He would obviously go on to dominate the race in his career, winning it on overall four times. Then 2006, I suppose, is quite memorable because Hinkapi for the Discovery Channel lost the race in a spectacular way when his steerer tube snapped. He was in the lead group looking good and, well, let's just say things didn't go his way. Now there is obviously plenty of other awesome additions, but I would be amiss without mentioning 2016 when Matt Heyman won. Now there'll be plenty of people happy that I'm including this one as a classic classic but I include it because I was lucky enough to be there and see firsthand how happy not just Heyman was, but Tom Boonen was for Matt Heyman. Tom got second, but looked as if he had won it himself. It showed that Heyman, Tom and Ian Stannard, who got third that day, all left the rivalry out on the road. True sportsmanship. OK, enough from the classics, classics. Let's delve into the tech. Right, tech time now, people. Let's delve in to some of the bikes that have crushed the cobbles, bounced over the cobbles, and even fallen apart over the rough stuff. First up, I'm going to throw you over to a man who uh, I've been lucky enough to ride with a couple of times. A man who has Roubaix, not just once or twice to his name, but, well, a good few times. Johan Museo, and he's going to tell you about a bike that he didn't particularly like. When you were racing, you rode on a Bianchi that was ahead of its time and that had suspension, front and rear suspension. Yeah. And my generation was a little bit different. The bike was coming over two days before, two days before the bike. And I have riding on the cobbles with it and it was really comfort. But oh, just on the cobbles, I have suspension in the front, the shock rock and in the middle also the bike. So a lot of movement, it was a lot more more dancing on the bike and All right, guys, nobody seconds. was thinking you will lose what no everybody talking about what 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 yeah. and yeah, uh, after 200 k i was really over so i have spent too much effort Schmiel was in the breakaway i was behind in seconds and i can't reach him so i can't say it, it was the bike but it was the bike <laughs> Now, Museo isn't the only one to have used suspension over the cobbles of Roubaix. It's been used plenty of time. In fact, the most recent, obviously, is Specialized Roubaix with their Future Shock suspension system up front. Trek one year supplied US Postal with a full suspension road bike, which they weren't actually allowed to ride. I think that was around about 98, 99. Seiko used the head sock system on their bikes as far back as 1997. They even got a second place using it with Dario Pieri. And recently Pinarello have not really produced a cobble crushing bike because the best they've ever got is third place with Stannard. But a bike that smoothed things out over the cobbles. Gotta admit, it's not the best of looking things, is it? But heck, all that technology doesn't mean a thing if you haven't got the legs. For instance, just look at Matthew Heyman. He rode a Scott Foil, which is their aero bike. Stiff, not the most comfortable thing to victory. Carbon now is the material of choice for building a bike. Well, not just a bike for Roubaix, but pretty much any high quality race bike. But the first carbon bike to come across the finish line in first place is the Colnago C40. Then, of course, we cannot do a Roubaix tech video without mentioning Steve Bowers. Eddie Merckx, that he rolled when he was with Motorola. That thing might have been smooth over the cobbles, but you try getting it round a corner. Steve Bauer and that Eddie Merckx isn't the only custom bike that has bounced over the cobbles of Roubaix. Plenty of riders have custom geometry bikes throughout the years. More so, historically, when it was steel, aluminium and titanium 
used in the building process. In fact, the last bike that wasn't made from carbon was a titanium bike powered to victory under Magnus Backstead. Since then, it's been carbon, carbon, carbon. Fabian Cancellara and the CSC team proved that carbon wheels with the zips that they were using could take the pounding from the cobbles. And since then, we've pretty much seen the demise of the, uh, the custom hand-built wheel vanish from the roads of Roubaix. In its place now, we see the pretty much stock standard wheels with wider tyres. On average though, we generally see riders using a 28 or a 30 millimetre tyre. Right, fingers crossed everybody, that 2021 brings us an edition of the race. Okay, join the conversation below. Let us know your favourite editions. Let us know your favourite bikes that have uh, bounced over them cobbles. Also, give us a like, give us a subscribe if you haven't already. And until next time, thank you for watching and enjoy your riding.